So here we're going to look at the melting behavior of a so-called binary system. The example we're going to give is forstrite and phthalite. So we have a, a single mineral phase, an olivine, but it has two components. At least the components we'll examine, forstrite, the magnesium-rich, and iron uh, phthalite, the iron-rich fellow. Those two components exhibit complete solid solution, and that affects the shape and the behavior of the phase diagram that we're going to look at. Let's start with forstrite. So forstrite has a composition of Mg2SiO4, and if we take pure forstrite and heat it, so imagine a temperature axis with temperature moving upwards here, we could increase it from, let's say, 20 degrees centigrade, something close to room temperature, up to about 1890 degrees centigrade, at which point it will melt. So everything below 1890 will be solid, Everything above 1890 will be liquid, and we have a very sharp melting point. We can do the same thing for phthalite. So phthalite has a composition of Fe2SiO4, and if we heat it up, uh, it will begin melting and will complete melting also at a temperature of about 1205 degrees centigrade. So anything above, uh, below 1205 would be solid, and then anything above above 1205 would be liquid, so it has a very sharp melting point. Now we can draw a horizontal axis that connects these two, and this will be a composition axis. We can let it represent the fraction of phthalate as we go from 0% phthalate, that would be something that's pure forstrite or pure magnesium in composition, to something that is 100% phthalate. We'll just use fractions and we'll call it 1. So that would be the case of something that is completely um, uh, iron in composition with no forstrite or magnesium components in it. And that should be a nice perfectly straight line and of course it's not. So uh, what if we have something that is a 50-50 mixture? It would fall at x for phthalate of 0 0.5 and its melting behavior will be quite different than the end members. The end members have a sharp melting point because they are pure substances. All pure substances, pure elements, pure compounds have a very sharp melting point. However, if we have mixtures, then mixtures will have a melting interval. And for this intermediate composition, you might imagine that it will begin melting at some temperature above 1205, but below 1890. So it'll, be, it'll begin melting somewhere in here, and it'll finalize its melting uh, also at some temperature below 1890. So below that initial melting point, it will be solid. Above this temperature here, it'll be liquid. But in between, we'll have a mixture of solid plus liquid. If we get closer and closer to the end members, then these melting intervals become very narrow, and we can connect all the dots. Let's see how well we can do it here. This electronic pen is not so easy to use, and we would have a melting curve. Let's rewrite that whole thing. That's a pretty ugly looking curve. So if we rewrite the whole thing, we would have a melting curve that looks something like this with pure forstrite melting at 1890 degrees centigrade and pure phthalate melting at something close to 1205. But for anything that is a mixture between forstrite and phthalate, then we would have a melting interval. Let's try to make a horizontal line. So if we have this mixture here, which is what? If we're going to have the axis x sub fa, it's maybe at about 33% or 0 0.33. 3.3. So if we have something that's 33% phthalate, <clears throat> it's going to melt over some interval, and that interval will be defined by uh, the, this lower curve here, which is the solidus, and this up, upper curve here, which is the liquidus. Now, why are they so called? Well, at every temperature below the solidus, we have things that are solid. So no matter what composition we choose, whether it's this much rich in phthalate or 50-50 or rich in forstrite, any composition that falls below that solidus curve, regardless of the composition, would be completely solid. Anything above the liquidus would be liquid. 
anything that falls between the curves will be a mixture of solid plus liquid. So let's say we take this composition here. Uh, this composition here at that temperature would be completely solid, whereas the same composition at this temperature here, so we'll just fix the composition there, at this temperature here would fall in that solid plus liquid interval, and at this temperature here would be completely liquid. If we have a composition that's way out here, notice that the same temperature as this forsterite rich fellow, draw a horizontal curve across, it, this composition here would all be almost entirely liquid, very close to the liquidus, maybe just be below it if I were a little bit better at drawing a horizontal line. Any case for this guy here, here's the range at which it would be very, it would be completely solid. Here's the temperature range over which it would be a mi mixture of solid plus liquid. And then anything above this temperature, we don't really need that downward arrow, anything above that liquidus, then the, the system would be liquid. So our phase diagram, let's just erase this and redraw it. Here's our phase diagram loop. So we have solid, solid plus liquid, and then liquid. It is more or less a map in temperature and composition space that tells us where we should expect to find solids and liquids. It does something else as well. We'll draw it a little bit more neatly to uh, illustrate one last concept. If we have a solid solution loop like this, and by the way, when we have loops like this, then by definition we have a solid solution. It means, uh, when we say a solid solution, it means that we could take forsterite and phthalate and mix them in any proportions we like, and we can have a solid that will absorb those compositional differences. So within this map, if we have, let's write out uh, solid plus liquid and in between the curves, liquid above, solid below. If we have some compositions, let's take, well, let's we'll take another forced right rich composition and take a vertical curve moving upwards so we can find out the temperature at which it melts. It would be this temperature here. We're not going to worry about the numbers. What's also important here, and we'll look at in a more quantitative example in another video, uh, what the, the solid uh, will create when it begins to melt is a liquid that will have a very different composition. This is very, very important for uh, understanding geologic systems. We're going to take a solid of this composition, which is at, oh, maybe XFA equals 0 0.3. So it's 30% phthalate, 70% forsterate. But the liquid that's going to come off of this is going to be much more iron rich. And the way we find that liquid is that if we, once we uh, find where the solid hits the solidus, we can take a horizontal curve and figure out where that line, that horizontal line, will meet the liquidus curve. And that liquidus curve will define the liquid composition. As you can see, that liquid is much more iron enriched. Uh, the XFA, the fraction of phthalate there, is much greater than it was for the case of our solid. So that's our solid, that's our liquid. Um, and this is at the heart of the idea behind fractionation where we can take a substance, melt it, and get a liquid that looks uh, very, very different. And if that liquid is buoyant and forms a volcanic material that creates a planetary crust, we can have a crust that looks very different than the olivine-rich source materials in the mantle that were partially melted to create that crust. And so this is how we get this kind of planetary differ differentiation between a core mantle and a crust, and a, an oceanic crust and a continental crust. But that's really for a later discussion. Here we just want to qualitatively introduce this idea of a binary phase diagram and the melting uh, characteristics of such.